Welcome to the Vin Armani Show. We are streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Vin Armani. Also on Twitter and Periscope at Vin Armani is my handle there. We are proud members of the Activist Post Podcast Network, so you can check out all of our audio archives by visiting activistpost.com. In addition, you can check us out on dozens of terrestrial radio stations as well as satellite and internet. We're members of the Liberty Radio Network, which you can visit at lrn.fm. So it's Monday morning, 10 a.m. Pacific time, and we are back once again. Have a great show for you today. My guest is returning to the show. We had a great interview the last time, but it's been over a year. Dan Johnson, executive director of We Do Better, uh, formerly known as the Tax Revolution Institute, but it's been sort of rebranded and reborn, and I think the mission now is even more coherent and uh, Dan is such a dynamic guy. Really, you know, I always, it's, it's the, the Maroads, that classic, uh, that classic question of who will build the roads. You know, Dan's one of those people who's really seeking to answer that question rather than just have it be academic, rather than just have it be, uh, you know, a, a discussion online or an argument on Twitter. There are those of us who really would like to answer the question and really would like to start building some things. And that's going to be a lot about uh, a lot of what today's show is about. No huge news stories, but uh, a conversation, and I think a very important conversation. Some things that have been occurring to me over the bat over the past month, but particularly the last week, and uh, culminating with the uh, Pork Fest, which is where I'm going to be in just a couple of days. So, got a great show planned for you. I think a great conversation, and of course. Wonderful conversation partner, as always, to help me get through all of this, my good friend, producer and co-host, Mr. Christian Reyes. Christian. Good morning, Ben. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? Doing great. How about you? I'm I'm doing quite well. I'm doing quite well. I've I've had an interesting week. A lot have spent a lot of time deep in thought. I've been preparing yeah. my presentation for Pork Fest, which we will talk nice. a little bit about. Um and so it's it's great because like that's one of the great things about doing this show is that it gives me this this um, just by itself I always have to take some time every week and think and think about okay what are we going to talk about what's important uh, if there's news stories really think about those news stories like how are we going to present them and um, you know also in terms of with the guests because I'd like things to be coherent I'd like to be able to have like a nice narrative that runs through the show and I think we do a pretty good job with that overall mm -hmm. um, so you know preparing my my uh, my talk that I'm giving at at Porkfest which is about decentralization it's that we've talked about this sort of matriarchy patriarchy uh, yeah. consensus versus authority and right. a lot of it has to do with the blockchain, and obviously it's things that I'm thinking about often when it comes to mm -hmm. Bitcoin. And I had an interesting experience, and so I wanted, to, I wanted to speak with you about that in particular. I think a good place to start, though, good place to start is, it is kind of this question of who will build the roads, right? Yeah. And so we've spent a lot of time on this show, and the history of this show has been all about what are the actual like solutions? What are the actual things that we can do, the games that we can play mm -hmm. inside of this grander game to move things forward? What can we do as individuals, right? So we've settled upon a few things. Now, I've written some of this stuff down. My book, Self-Ownership, that's there. That's one thing. That's a game that we're playing. If people want to go, go check that out, selfownership.me, they can go, they can take a look. I think it's a good uh, starting point, and towards the end of the summer, I think probably once it starts to get a little colder, I'll start in on the second book in that trilogy, which is called Render Unto Caesar. So we've talked about that. Yeah. That's only for cryptocurrency, right? We've also talked about, now, now you have been playing with a, an idea and a, con I, I, playing is the wrong word. You have been evolving a concept around mm -hmm. apparel, around ideas, uh, yeah. you know, start, you had art of war when I first met you about yeah. how do you take an idea, a meme, put it onto clothing. So we've got govern yourself, right? Yeah. So that's another way that we're playing this game. So throw up governyourself.com, G-V-R-N-U-R-S-L-F.com. 
Here's some of the shirts. Read 1984. Man, this keeps coming up. Bitcoin and Ethereum and Litecoin and blockchain. Simple economics for Bitcoin Cash. That's a very important statement. You've got Dash there. No hodl, meaning spend and replace. Very important. The individual shirt, I love that. Make Bitcoin Cash again. Anarchy Ball on a women's tee and the ANCAP flag. So we, this is something we've never really talked about. Can you go into a little, a little bit of detail about the concept around art, wearing the art, how it interacts with, with you when you're, when you're wearing these? Like, we haven't really, we, we talk about the shirts, we talk about Govern Yourself, but I realized this mm -hmm. week we have not really delved into the depth of this because you've thought a lot about this. Can you talk about yeah. where, what, how this whole thing works? Absolutely. So there's two things really um, that I was looking at when I started creating, especially in fashion and design and stuff like that. And the two things, they're pretty simple. It's, uh, it's one, the way that you feel when you're doing something. Because when you feel a certain way, feelings are really the communication that's happening between you and the universe. So it's um it's not necessarily like the way we think of it like praying and like um uh, verbal communication when you're communicating with the universe it's the way that you feel the feelings are really the language that the universe speaks and that's how they respond yeah. the second thing is manifestation so how do you bring these thoughts and ideas into the physical reality so those two things working hand in hand together I really believe that if you do those two things, you start to embody them. You start to become them. So like wearing a t-shirt is a prime example of that because when you wear a t-shirt, especially something that you believe in, something something that makes you look good, you're going to feel good. You're going to start to demonstrate those things that you believe in to other people and start sharing and spreading those ideas. So with Art of War, it's it's 100% a meme. 100% a meme. And that's actually what art does too. Art gets inside of, um, you know, whoever is creating it and also whoever is viewing it and starts to demonstrate ideas and also bring those ideas into physical reality by feelings and manifestation. So we're talking about a kind of a feedback loop in this regard. It's like you Absolutely. sort of, you, uh, you display the art and then by displaying it or by, uh, embracing it as an aspect of your identity or as a message that you're pushing out to the world, then it's that reflexivity, right? That the world then reflects something back onto you. We've talked about this so many times about identity, right? About like, yeah. if you want to craft identity, you have to push out into the world the identity that you want because you, you have to take conscious control over that because if you don't, the world is going to assign an identity to you anyway. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Anyway. Like, so you can either say, I'm choosing this identity. This is what I want because you're paying attention to it and you're, you're pushing off the signals because people are constantly looking to try to put you in a box, right? We all do right. this. Our brain naturally does this. Like it sees somebody and it's like, takes a quick do, 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 do. Okay. They're this, right? Mm -hmm unless unless you are actively pushing out and communicating from yourself a meme that is you and the more genuine that is the more genuine that meme is the 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 better the chance that it will solidify and that others will take it on so so the project as i see it with govern yourself is like where it starts because we sell it for crypto right so yeah. where it starts is if you don't have crypto, going and getting the crypto in the first place. Absolutely. Right? So it's like that action in and of itself makes when you put that Bitcoin Cash shirt on and it says simple economics on it and you've paid for it with Bitcoin Cash, it's, it's genuine. Like mm -hmm. you are participating at that point. Right? Embodiment. It, Exactly. It's not just like, you know, uh, uh, you know, World Cup is going on right now. It's not just like people are putting on soccer jerseys right. for their country like 
like and, they're playing on the team. <laughs> but like they that they've never even owned a soccer jersey before, especially right. women. Always the case during World Cup, right? During uh -huh. World Cup, women are putting on these soccer jerseys and they don't even like soccer, football, whatever. Mm -hmm. But they get into it for World Cup because it's part of this whole thing. And it's like, okay, but that's not genuine. That's not genuine. You're, you're, mm -hmm. you're a spectator. You're a fair weather fan. You're a homer. That's what they call them, homers, right? The same way that like, uh, now granted, Vegas Knights, Las Vegas, as I was shocked at, at how the city... From the beginning, from the first game of the season, it was, it's crazy. The city was in love with the Golden Knights, mm -hmm. in love with them, and it was like so. When they made it all the way, you know what I mean, to the to the championship, that was like legit that the city. But yet, come the playoffs, there were still a whole lot of girls around Vegas who started yeah, wearing a... Golden Knights <laughs> stuff, and they didn't know nothing about hockey. You know what I mean? Right. Nothing about right. hockey. So it, I, I'm feeling like. And so this, this kind of, this gets me into kind of what I wanted to discuss today, right? I, this, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a perfect example and it gets into this thing about who will build the roads and what I've been seeing over the past week, okay? So mm -hmm. let's, uh, this is, so basically this is, I had, a, I had a interesting conversation. Let's just put it like that. I had an interesting conversation that was kind of a wrap up of the, the, the previous beef of the last week or whatever that during that time some guys had asked me if i would come on their podcast and we could like hash out what what are the issues right yeah and so i went on and it was very cordial and nice and an interesting conversation and but what i found so interesting about the conversation and sitting there and having this conversation was so these guys are they they do a podcast that is it's got BCH in the name, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, it's all about BCH. They've identified themselves with BCH. They use the logo of BCH as their logo. And at one point I, you know, I ask, okay, well, do you guys sell anything for Bitcoin Cash or do you like take payment like your wages in Bitcoin Cash? Yeah. No, answers no. Do you spend Bitcoin Cash? Like how, in? I was like, in a month, what percentage of like your necessities or anything like that do you spend crypto? Any crypto. It was like, very rarely. There's one mm -hmm. restaurant in my town that takes it. And I was like, okay, that's weird. Like, that's, to me, that's like you're just wearing the jersey. Exactly. Because this is a participatory sport. Like, the whole yeah. entire point of Bitcoin is that it's permissionless. You can participate. No one can stop you. <laughs> and, like, if there's only... If you, if you have so taken on to your identity this cryptocurrency... You know, like, we talked with, with Joel Valenzuela, right, the la last week. Mm -hmm. Now, this guy... He goes out and he talks to he talks to merchants trying to get he onboards them. He he's constantly setting people up with wallets. He's he's engaging uh, the the community and trying to push the thing forward. Embodiment. He's Total the embodiment embody. of it. Yeah. But it's like if how is it that you are so identified with this particular cryptocurrency? And there's still only one restaurant in your town that takes it. I'm going mm -hmm. to assume that that means you haven't talked to any restaurants in your town. I'm going to assume that it wasn't actually you that is responsible for the restaurant that's in your town taking it. Why are we sitting here having this conversation? Why are you not out actually doing something? Like, what do you think this is? I don't understand. Like, you're a spectator. Yep. You're, specta you're spectating. You're asking who will build the roads. And then you're very, very interested in, like, as opposed to picking up a shovel and, and going out and actually building the roads, you're very, very interested in making commentary on the people who are building the roads. 
why do you think that this is happening what's the major see, like this, see this is this is where i'm like i don't understand this because it's like is it even is it even exciting like <laughs> if you're not using it right if you're mm -hmm. not using it you're not going out and getting people to participate in the adoption you're not doing any development you're not selling any goods how is this interesting to you like what is interesting about it and i think i have an answer hmm. so well let's start here okay why is cryptocurrency interesting to me and why has it always been interesting to me since i've encountered it i think a good place to start with this is the reason why cryptocurrency bitcoin really has any value at all whatsoever and the very first guest on our show very first guest lynn Ulbricht, ross Ulbricht, sitting in jail created silk road it used bitcoin for transactions of very valuable things only Bitcoin was the only way on the dark web. What were they trying to do? What was the tool? How, what was Bitcoin a tool to manifest, right? What was mm -hmm. the identity that they were pushing out to the world that then through the use of Bitcoin, they were able to manifest? Put up this, um, do we have Silk Road? Put up the Silk Road thing. I'm going to read the Silk Road Charter. We've read it before, but it's been a while. For people who don't know, so Silk Road, for those who don't know, Silk Road is the reason why Bitcoin is, is worth a damn. Because there was on Tor, on the dark web, there was a site called Silk Road. Ross Ulbricht was the founder, but we don't know if he was running it at the time when things went in a certain direction. We don't know. Uh, I'll see Lynn at Porkfest. You should go back and watch some of our conversations with Lynn on this show. Lynn Ulbricht, his mother, and uh, the head of the, the movement to free Raw, something that's very, very important to us. This is the charter of Silk Road, the, the mission statement. Silk Road is a global enterprise whose purpose is to empower people to live as free individuals. We provide systems and platforms that allow our customers to defend their basic human rights and pursue their own ends, provided those ends do not infringe on the rights of others. Our mission is to have voluntary interaction between individuals be the foundation of human civilization. We conduct ourselves and our enterprises from the following fundamental values that are at the heart of who we are. Self-ownership. Individuals own their bodies, thoughts, and will. Anything they create with their property or obtain without coercion is also theirs. Responsibility. People are responsible for their actions. If one infringes on another's rights, they should be held accountable. Equality. Property rights apply to all individuals equally, without exception. Integrity. Honoring one's word as oneself. Word, thought, and action are aligned. Virtue. Striving to improve oneself and the lives of others in all actions to create value. We promise to be true to our purpose to accomplish our mission, to operate consistent with our values, and to run our enterprise in service of our customers. This is who we are. This is what you can count on. Christian, you can come back to us. Powerful. Amazing. Powerful. Powerful. Yeah. And the greatest tool for that, Bitcoin. Bitcoin. That's mm -hmm. what Bitcoin is a tool of. But you notice there was no mention of cryptocurrency in there. There was no mention of mining. There was no mention of, of the blockchain. There was no mention of the Bitcoin community. This, no. Mm -hmm. No. It's a tool for the empowerment of individuals. It's a way to break out of the authoritarianism that has, and collectivism that has held the species back. That's what it's for. Mm -hmm. Now, the Roger Veers of the world, that's what they're about. The Eric Voorhees of the world, that's what they're about. Me, that's what I'm about. It's a tool. 
But I ask, if that's not where you're coming from, why is Bitcoin interesting to you? Why is it interesting to you? Mm -hmm. Like, it's interesting, like, govern yourself. This is a meme. This is an identity. This is Absolutely. an extension of this whole idea. The, the, the words and the art and the images that you're putting on apparel for someone to wear and to express out to the world is to express these ideas. What the hell is the logo of a particular, like, who cares what the Bitcoin logo is? Yeah. <laughs> Who cares what it's even called? If the tool can accomplish that, then that's the tool. Mm -hmm. And so if people want to see what that looks like in practice, you can see it. I'm going to be out speaking. I said I was speaking. Lynn will also be there. I think she's actually speaking. She might be speaking on stage right before me, as a matter of fact, I think. And then Joel Valenzuela is right after me on Friday. At awesome. Pork Fest, if you want to throw up this Pork Fest thing, if you can find it. So, Porcupine Freedom Festival, it's actually uh, starts tomorrow, June 19th through 24th. All I get there on Wednesday. This is number 15, Pork Fest 15, Porcupine Freedom Festival, the Free State Project's big summer event. It's at Rogers Campground in Lancaster, New Hampshire. This year, I think they're expecting uh, close to 2,000 people. It's kind of like a, a camping event, but there are some like smaller kind of like hotel motels in the area, and there's also a, a small motel on the, the campground. If you're in, particularly if you're in New England, or even if maybe you want to fly in from like Toronto, or you want to fly in from Chicago area, or, or somewhere in the northern Midwest, or hell, even the mid-Atlantic, D.C., whatever, you can totally still get uh, tickets. You can get a pass for just a day. It's 40 bucks for just the day. Uh, or you can get, I think it's 100, 150, something like that for, all, for the whole entire thing. Super fun. Come out. You can come back to us, Christian. But the, but the interesting thing is there's a whole, there's going to be vendors, tons of vendors, food, all kinds of like, you know, different crafts clothes so cool all that and you and everybody's going to take crypto mm -hmm. everybody's going to total take crypto, right yeah total. and there's there's no like business licensing required or anything like that it's no there's no shakedown from the state it's like you get to spend a week with people and you get to see who will build the roads people protecting one another people looking out for one another bring the kids there's all, all kinds of kid activities there's it's just great that people can actually do this. And crypto enables that. Yeah. Bitcoin enables that. Like, Bitcoin enables that. So then my question becomes, it's like, how, I don't see you there. Like, not you specifically. I'm like, I don't mm -hmm. see these people who are so, who have, have made this tool part of their identity. I don't see them using the tool. Right. I don't see them using the tool. And so I've been thinking a lot about this because see somebody wouldn't somebody wouldn't go through all of that work. And they wouldn't tie their identity to a to a meme that then becomes relatively meaningless yeah. except as a totem to like connect a group of people but like it's connecting a group of people that aren't using the tool see because the people using the tool are connected through the virtue of using the tool mm -hmm. so these must be people this is a community of individuals who are like again it's like it's the difference between a, like a team so say like a, a a soccer team on the field they're all wearing the jersey to identify them, each other on the field, of course. Mm -hmm. But they're also, like, having an impact on the game. Right, and the, and the difference, too, one thing to note is that with that particular situation, the team members can only be part of the team. With crypto, everybody can be part of crypto. This is what I'm saying. So, but everybody can also be a spectator. Yeah, 
<laughs> I mean, technically, the team members could decide that they were going to get off the field and go into the stands and just watch the game. They could make that right, decision. Right. <laughs> like, they could. And, and, of course, they're spectators when they're not playing and they're watching mm. their friends play or other teams play. So there is a spectator aspect, but it's like, to be a spectator in the crypto world is like, the fuck is that even? And I would even say it takes more energy or this, let's say the same amount of energy to be a spectator as it, as it would to be. This is what I'm saying. <laughs> this is, this is why it's been like, it's been, it's been something that's been going in my head and I've been like, okay, what is this? So interesting. there's this guy, Daniel Krawitz. He's, he's very very intelligent guy we're going to have him on the show he just agreed today in mid-june i think the 16th we're going to have him on the show but he's had some done some interesting that he's written a ton of stuff he's the nakamoto Nak, nakamoto i get these two confused there's satoshi nakamoto institute nakamoto studies institute no nakamoto in satoshi institute i don't know he's the he started the one that Derek mcgill forked okay mm -hmm. But he's kind of fallen out with BTC, and he talks a lot about like the this the idea of the cult, that there's this cult, and and I, I I've definitely started to see that. And what's interesting is I've started to on Twitter I I realized I look back and I realized how much time I was dedicating out of my day in these Twitter conversations with individuals who were spectators. Mm. See, so we're players. We're on the field. Yeah, right. Like, I was stopping playing the game to have a conversation with spectators during the game. Right, right, during the game. It'd be like playing in the World Cup, and then an uh, audience member comes up and says, hey, this is how you should shoot the goal. And you're like, I'm playing the game, dude. <laughs> well, <laughs> and even more so, kind of even like streakers right? Yeah. Like some of right. them are just streakers. They just take off their clothes and they just run across the field and just the game has to stop. Yeah. Right. Until they're done showing their ass on the field. <laughs> and, and what I started doing, which is interesting, I just started muting them. Hmm. Not blocking, not blocking. Yeah. But like for my own benefit, I just started muting them. And you know what I realized? Like, oh, I really was literally just wasting my time. And that's 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 the embodiment because it's the same thing with building the roads and the government and all that stuff is like yeah, they want you to resist, of course. Right. You know, they want you to participate and get your energy all tied up in that, you know, get things moving a little bit. They want you to do that because that's total distraction. Your focus isn't on building. So I I I I'm like, I'm a little hesitant with this to use this whole, this whole cult thing. But I, mm -hmm. I did, the past couple of days, I started to think about this phenomenon. And I want to talk about it a little bit. So the phenomenon is called, and don't, don't throw it up quite yet. The phenomenon okay. is called a cargo cult. Cargo cult. Have you mm -hmm. heard of this before? No, never. Okay. So these are like religions, I guess you could call them that exist in uh, micro, Micronesia and Melanesia. And so basically these are kind of Pacific Islanders, also like kind of like Indonesia. Um, these are kind of these dark skinned, they almost look like, like, like Australian Aborigines. They're probably related in some mm -hmm. way, like Java, Tana, like those types of places. We, when you see these these pictures, you'll you'll be like, okay, I think I've seen these these types of people in in different documentaries and whatnot. So in their society, th how they deal with the the idea of wealth is wealth actually comes from how much debt is owed to you by other people. Hmm. Mm hmm. So they have this highly reciprocal society. I mean, it's small communities on these islands. They have highly reciprocal society. Also, you figure it's kind of interesting the way that they've approached store of value because it's hot, 
right? They probably don't have a lot of facility for like, if there's extra, stopping it from spoiling and things like that, right? So yeah. it's like, you can't really store value, but what you can do is, you have extra, you give away anything that would spoil, and then that person is immediately in debt to you. And so you're wow. keeping this, it's interesting when it comes to like, we're talking about finance yeah. and blockchain and all of this, it's like, Oh, what a cool way of figuring out a store of value that it's like, it's not about what you have. It's about what you're owed because what you're owed actually represents what you had. Yeah. But so it's like, it's like getting, it's like money back. It's it, right. there and it's small enough that they're all keeping an account. Right. So and it cut, I would imagine it cuts down on waste a lot oh, too. What? It's great. Right. It's great. Yeah. If you can keep track. And this was yeah. this was actually a pretty early way of doing accounting anyway. Like you go back mm -hmm. to early writing, certainly like cuneiform and things like that. The the earliest records that they have are these sorts of records, like uh, accounts that pe accounts receivable and payable that people had. Like I owe you this amount and you owe me script, right? It's script. We've talked right. about all these sorts of things, bills of exchange and all of that, right? So they had this society. And so that's what made you rich. What made you rich is, is debt. But what also came into it was like, <laughs> you, someone could put you in debt. Like you couldn't, it was almost like culturally you couldn't say no. If hmm. someone was giving you something, it's like culturally you could not say no. Like you had to take on the debt from them. Wow. And so then people who were in, everybody was indebted to them, they called them big men. And people who could never pay off any of the debts, they called them rubbish men. And so then <laughs> that was the hierarchy of the society. Yeah. Right? Can you pay back a debt when somebody asks, like, can you get even with the tribe? Are you like even? Are you up? Are you down? In, and so it's this whole society of like, okay, I only need this much. Go give it away. Give it away. Interesting. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, this really became a problem when the Europeans started coming, and particularly around the time of, like, World War II, because they came, and so those islands were launching off points for the military. They would come, and they would bring cargo from hmm. airplanes. These people didn't know, you know, much about these airplanes from these big ships. And they'd yeah. bring all this stuff, and they had extra, and they'd give it to the people. And so these people were basically colonized by their, their debt system to where they, they had gotten so much from the Americans or the British or whoever, and even the Japanese before like, so the Japanese got too brutal during World War II, they, they realized we can never pay this back. And it gave them this huge complex, right? And... and what the, the holy men started to say was because they had never seen any of this stuff be manufactured. That's the thing. Hmm. So they thought it was all coming from like the spirit world. Right. That these, that there, that there was sorcery involved. Oh shit. But they couldn't figure out what the ritual was. They couldn't figure out what is the ritual that makes the ship show up with the magical cargo. And they were like, Hmm. Is it, is it the things they're writing down on, is, is it those scratches they're making on paper? Perhaps it's that, because there was somebody doing that as it came off. Hmm. Is it that device that they have that makes the noise and they call, because it seems like they call, they make noises into this thing, and then a plane lands. Perhaps mm -hmm. it's that. Is it when they all sit down around a table and talk to each other? Is it when they march <laughs> through the streets like this with rifles on their shoulders? Is it that? Is uh, that marching perhaps what makes the cargo come? And so, so after a while, and the crazy thing is, they've seen all this stuff now. They know it. The cargo cults still continue. What you wind up with is you wind up with, go to this cargo cult thing. So this is super interesting. They'll like build airplanes out of like wicker to do what we're talking about though right to try to manifest an airplane to show up mm -hmm. here they've built a little uh, helicopter 
and they're walking with it. Now, again, this is in the modern times, but they've stayed with the cargo cults. Here they are doing a march. So they do these, like, this, this is a ritual of their religion. Even though now they know where this stuff comes from, they still do it. They have a, a Prince Philip cult. Because there were pictures, like, of the prince and all of that during World War II. Yeah. So you could come, uh, Crazy. You could come back to us. Weird, right? But, yeah. But I'm starting to get where you're going now. Are you I'm starting told, to get where I'm going? Yeah. Are totally, you starting totally. to see yeah. <laughs> what I'm kind of saying? Yeah. Here's the deal. It's like there's no amount of talking about or praying to the Bitcoin Cash logo that's going to bring the 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 bounty. Yeah. There's no amount of talking about what some miner should and could and should not do. There's no talking about what the, the po endless possibilities of, uh, you know, a decentralized Twitter that's on the blockchain. There's no amount of that. That's just cargo cult shit. Mm -hmm. You're just in a cargo cult. That doesn't bring the good stuff. That doesn't bring it. Yeah. It doesn't manifest it. Right, right. What I was thinking about too when we first started talking about this was what like what ran through my mind was what are the things that are actually preventing people from embodying? Go ahead. And uh, one of the things that I've been through personally and I was looking at is probably fear. Mm. So fear like people will maneuver, they will get out of the way of doing anything. You know, anything in action taking stuff because they're scared of the result or they're scared of even like good results. They're hmm. scared of like responsibility. They're scared of, so fear will prevent them. So instead they want to align with a certain belief or ideology or whatever it is. They do everything but the thing. Hmm. You know what I mean? So like it, I know this because I fell in that trap myself. You know, I was actually doing some things like that when it, when it came to like, like business and stuff like that. Like there was something in me and I didn't really know what it was. And then that's why I started having to look into the spiritual side of things and understanding like I had this subconscious block that was per that was making me move in this direction. And I started to understand it. And then the crazy thing is too, is like once you get going with it, once you start doing the things, it looks ridiculous. You know, you're like the fear, you're once, saying the fear looks ridiculous. Well, yeah, exactly. The fear looks ridiculous. And also like, like, it's like going to the gym, you go to the gym, you start working out. The first part is like, fuck, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to do it. And then you get into it like, oh, my God, this is amazing. You know, it's that same thing. It's like getting through that first, you know, couple minutes of the pain. And usually what prevents people from doing that is like that first couple minutes, like, like facing it, you know, what I mean, the fear of that. So I think that understanding this conversation and, and where you're going with it. I think that that could be one of the major underlying tones with this whole thing is like people are actually afraid of that responsibility mm. of using cryptocurrency, of embodying cryptocurrency. Like they're so dependent on other things that they're actually kind of scared to do it themselves, you know? I mean, it's, it, I, I think that, I think that makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. I, I wonder you know, I wonder what I could be doing to... Well, I think one thing that... Saying that, I, th I think that... I think sa in, in you saying that, it clears up for me why doing a mute in some of those situations is positive. Mm -hmm. Because it's almost like responding to someone when they're, when they're in a mode of irrational fear. Right. Almost locks the fear in even more right mm -hmm. to where it's like i almost see that it's you know you're with a group of people and you're gonna go do something and there's somebody who's really fearful and they're like i don't want to do that i'm scared i'm scared it's mm -hmm. almost worse for you especially if you know like there's nothing to be afraid of it's almost worse for you to sit there with them and be like okay let's talk about what you're afraid of now yeah. let me tell you yeah there's mm -hmm. nothing to worry about. 
It's going to be okay. I know it's going to be okay. You just got to trust me. It's almost better to just be like, you quit being a bitch and just walk forward. Right. It's the, it's the three second rule with pickup. It's, it's the like... three second rule. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, like if I'm spending more than three seconds thinking about this, don't even, don't mm -hmm. even. So, you know, I'm, I know that my t my time is best spent building, but it's also it's not like I don't want to answer people's questions. Yeah. But I also realized in this whole sort of muting thing, like when I really stopped to think about it, I was like. I can tell whether or not this person is just being contrarian and argumentative, which is a f which is fear, right? Or whether they're legitimately trying to get to some truth, and they either don't understand or they disagree. But by but by communicating with each other, we can find some common ground and we can actually get closer to the truth. I can tell the difference in that in like one back and forth. Right. And what I've taken to now is it's like, if I see somebody just coming with the bullshit, you're getting the mute. <laughs> because, and this is the reason why. Because I don't have... I know my own limitation of wanting desperately for someone else to understand. Right. I want, I'm communicating because I want desperately for this person to be able to walk through the world with less fear. Mm -hmm. It's actually making me, they're introducing fear into my world. And if yeah. for nothing else, I'm, I'm interacting with them to crush the overall, um, they've introduced fear. Now I have to destroy that fear Yeah. for myself, Right. for my own well-being. Like I can't just... I can't just let that linger in my world. Mm -hmm. And it's better off to just yeah. be like, oh, nope, you're a bringer of fear. Boom, wall. And it's like, I'm not, I'm not going to block you. I'm not going to block you. You don't even know whether or not I can hear you. And it's actually almost better that you think I can hear you, but that I just mm -hmm. kept moving forward anyway. Yeah. That's as, I mean, in that's... It's, it's the place that I've come to, and, I've, and I just, for me coming here and then interacting with people, going to things like Porkfest where I'm like, no, this is real. All you have to do to not be afraid is just experience it one time. Mm -hmm. One time. And you will not be afraid. People won't even take that step. But yet... But yet they want desperately to be a part of. And so I guess that's the whole thing, that it's like this community in many ways has reached a critical mass. We saw it with, mm -hmm. co with the whole core thing and the core trolls and all of that, which that is all fear. And we've talked about that on the show. <laughs> yeah. Now I see it in the Bitcoin cash side, and it's just this, this swirling of fear. And they're just swirling around each other in this world of fear. Mm -hmm. And, and, and they take to like anything that creates cognitive dissonance, anything, it's almost at the point where it's such a, a whirlwind of a blade of fear that it's just seeking out anything that could possibly represent hope to try to just cut it down because that mm -hmm. might stop the momentum of the whirlwind of fear. Yeah. I think it was, I want to say it was Gandhi or something that has a really good quote. He said, people think that hate is the enemy, but it's fear, mm. something of that nature. Mm. And it's, I, it's totally true, man. Fear is like, it's a, it's a crazy emotion. It really, it causes a lot, it destroys a lot of things. And it's really something that on the spiritual side and the physical side, people just need to understand what it is. It's there. And it's it's probably not going to go away, but just to keep moving through it, you know, just to keep uh, creating through it. And if you if you really start to understand fear, you're going to understand that it's actually it it's definitely a very beautiful thing. But you have to understand that it's a beautiful thing and use it for your benefit. Mm. You know, it's it's really people think that um, fear and love are kind of the 
the or I guess two separate things, but the opposite, and they're actually the same thing, but just totally separate frequencies, totally separate right. energies. You know. Well, they're huge but, motivations. Um, they're both. They both will motivate. Exactly, their motivation. Their motivation, and it depends on how you look at it. it depends mm. on how you actually. It de- take that back. It depends on how you participate with it. Go on. Go on. So if you if you use it to motivate you and to push you forward, that's how you're participating with it, not speculating and looking at it. Then mm. that will move you forward, and eventually you get to the point where you're like, okay, fear is really kind of an illusion, and it's a good thing. Just like anything in the world, good or bad, any any situation doesn't matter what it is. There's always going to be. Uh, people think that there's a positive and a negative. It, there's a positive, or there's a only a positive and a negative, but there's both at the same time. Mm. So the same thing with fear. Fear can be looked at in a very positive way, and it's and when you start to move through it, start to embody it. Because I went through this process myself. You start to move through it, you understand it, and and you start to become not necessarily numb to it, but you understand it so well that it doesn't really affect you, you know, in that way, in a negative way, I should say. Well, I think one of the things also about this particular community, and I think the reason why, the reason why talking about the Bitcoin community, Bitcoin in particular, uh, as a community, not so much Ethereum, I would include Dash in the Bitcoin community, because Dash is a Bitcoin clone with some stuff on top of it. So it's kind of a different variant of, like I say, it's like the Mormons. It has kind of the rela- same relationship to uh, Christianity that uh, Mormons have, you know what I mean? Or to Bitcoin that Mormons have to Christianity, to where it's like, Jesus is kind of in there. He's yeah, kind of yeah. in the story, <laughs> but he's kind of not the same dude, you know what I mean? But it's but they, right. they but he's, he's the guy, but he's doing some other things in some other places, and that's kind of how I see Dash's relationship to Bitcoin. But it's still, to me, part of the greater Bitcoin story, right? Because it doesn't exist unless you have Bitcoin. Um, the reason why it's important is because, and this is a lot of what my talk on Friday at, at Porkfest is going to be about, I really do think that these are the new organizational models because I think that the way people are, and particularly crypto Twitter, because yeah. I don't, we're never going to be in a time, conceivably in the future, there's never going to be a time when there isn't going to be an ongoing cultural conversation that's taking place 24 hours a day, millions of people that you can't just plug into. And it's only going to get, that web is only going to get tighter and mm-hmm. the fact of the matter is that that really represents the sort of uh, the small world graph organizational structure of Bitcoin. So when we look at this technology and, and how it works, and then we see, oh, and it spawned off this culture as well that's utilizing these other tools, like, as Chris Rose said, programming the silicon and programming the carbon. Yeah. We can look forward to more and more of our lives coming into contact and being as a result of these conversations occurring, these levels of consensus. And so I think that looking at, because just the Bitcoin community, as we said, it's like, well, what, it's just, they're talking about this technology. It's like, they're talking about a computer network. And most of them are not even like, they're really talking about a totem, right? Because most of them are not even using the computer network. They're just talking about it. Mm-hmm. They're a cargo cult. But that gives us a really good look at like, but what are the core fundamentals? Because you're able to strip everything away because there's nothing else there. There's right. nothing but just human beings swirling around a totem. And then you get to look at that dynamic and that will help us to explain things as we move into the future and we see real things like food, like power, like transportation, mm-hmm. and all of these things are, fall into those conversations as well. Right. And people break off into cultures based on those as well. I'm just thinking, you know, I, I see, I, I, I like what you said about. I like what you said about how you how you move forward or, or, or trying to figure out how to move forward, how to interact with that fear. I don't I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly what to 
do or if people can be helped, right? I mean, I think mm -hmm. selling, th the first thing is buy something. Right. Actually, Sell I wanted, something. Go ahead. I want to mention something I just saw in the chat. Doug Seibom. Yep, yep, I know Doug. Doug's uh, an old <clears throat> friend of mine. Yeah, he's great. Uh, he said, the first thing I bought for crypto was Vin's book. There you go. So many people have said that to me. Oh, this is you, your book is the reason why I went out and got Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Is the reason why I went and got crypto in the first place. It's yeah, and it's as simple as that. I think the I think the word that or what we're looking at really is action. What action actions can will... you take? Well, here's what's interesting. We had Mance Raider on the show, right? Mm -hmm. And I had been saying to him, and I said to him on the show, I was like, "Oh, you got to set up." And he said, "Oh, I'm going to set it up and, and do for crypto." Do you know he had it set up that night? to sell his books yeah, for crypto. Awesome. And he reached out to me and he was like, he texted me and he was like, dude, I'm having some problems. Can you help me uh, set this up? And he gave me some admin access to his WordPress and we got it set up over the course of maybe, took, took maybe 45 minutes. Dude, and then the next day he's like, I've already sold four books. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and now like he's way more involved, but he actually has a stake. And so it's like, sell something. Figure out a product, mm -hmm. sell something, buy something. You know, if there's not, if you can't figure out what to buy, what's your favorite, favorite place to eat in town? That's like, you know, quick lunch or whatever. What's the place that you find yourself out at a lot? Mm -hmm. Find out if you could talk to a manager, see if you can get them to accept crypto, show them the any pay point of sale and tell them, you know what? I'll at least always come by more and pay in crypto. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, and I'll tell everybody else about it. Start there. It's any action. It could be as simple as telling somebody about it. Because what will happen is like if you tell somebody about it and you're not doing it, it'll, it'll get you to do it. You know, you start telling enough people about it. You're like, okay, like I need to start doing that. I can't just be telling people, <laughs> you know. And it's, so. it's not, and it's not just because you think about how much time it would take to build a replica airplane out of like palm fronds and bamboo. Yeah. Think about what you could have done in that time, man. Mm -hmm. You could have actually built something of use. Instead, you spent all that time constructing something that has absolutely no use except purely for something for you and the other people who don't want to actually take any real action to just sit around and look at and hope that something mm -hmm. good will happen. I went through this with a with a good friend of mine through social media actually and that that's what it reminded me of is like I think what's happening there is they build this thing and they get rewarded for it. And then they're like, "Oh, let's build another thing." And it's like, "No, like you're building something that takes away, you should not get rewarded for it." And I saw that with social media like a friend would post something about what they're going to do. And then they look at like, everybody's like responding, oh, this guy's, you know, that's cool, blah, 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 blah. And he gets all his motivation taken away because he got, he got the, the reward. reward. He got yeah. the reward. Yeah. I think, that, so, I think that right there, I think you hit the nail on the head. That what it becomes about is it ceases to be about this common goal. Mm-hmm. It ceases to be about a, a, a vision and a mission like the Silk Road Charter of like, why are we doing this? What is our vision? What is our mission? Why are we doing this? And it starts to become about, oh, if I do this signal, this virtue signal, yeah. I get rewarded. And then you start to build entire nothing. structures that are nothing but a virtue signal yeah yep that are giant planes made out of wicker and and palm fronds that are nothing more than a virtue signal it starts to become who not not a question of is building this plane actually bringing any cargo because we've been building mm -hmm. these planes for like a hundred years and no cargo has has showed up because of these planes it stops being about that and it starts being about a celebration of oh he is the most amazing fake plane builder <laughs> look at how big his fake yeah. plane is he built a fake b-52 bomber yeah yeah 
It's like, yeah, he spent a whole bunch of time wasting time. Mm -hmm. Wasting time. I'm into, I'm into being a vehicle. And I'm into building an actual vehicle that is going to get us from here to there. And everybody yeah. can do that. Everybody can do that. It's as simple as buying something with crypto, selling something with crypto, learning to code, learning to code, throw up code from go, code from go, go ahead. Registration, it says registration is open. Registration is not open. It is not open right now, but it will be very soon. Uh, prob I'm thinking end of July, we're just getting at, at Cointext, we're just, as a matter of fact, I have a call in a couple of hours, we are just finalizing the end of our sort of legal and financial reorganization with a nice influx of capital that's going to help us move forward in a very fast way. I'm just going to be nose down in code myself. So people have been asking, I'm thinking end of July will be the class. So probably beginning of July, maybe it'll be beginning of August that I start the class. Mid-July, I'll put up for the registration. So stay tuned. This is, a, I mean, you can actually start, that, that's when you really start to feel the power. When you really start to feel powerful is when you have access at the code level to creating your own transactions, to querying the blockchain yourself, and there's nobody else there. There's not even like a wallet manufacturer in between you and the blockchain and it's your code, that's when you start to feel really powerful. And that's when you realize the things that really can be done. And there need to be more of us doing that. The people who really truly are believing in this, there need to be more of us doing that. And I'm sitting here trying so hard. <laughs> this is the way, it is. I'm not gonna stop though. This is a multi, multi-decade for me. You come back to us, Christian. That's the, that's the one thing about this for me. It's like, that's why I moved here to New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is, this is what I'm going to spend until I'm old because I can't like, it's going to take that long. And it's that it's, it's worth it to me. And it's, it's intriguing and it's fun and it's growing and it's rewarding and valuable. And it's just, um, amazing. I mean, it's when, when <laughs> it's pretty damn cool, dude, it really yeah. is. It really is yeah. super, super cool. Uh, it's the most interesting and I think exciting thing that that a person could possibly be doing at this point. And it's and it really is like it's this non-violent, very peaceful, friendly, positive way to really change the world. I mean, mm -hmm. really change it. And 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 you know what? Talk talk is important and fellowship is important. Talking mm -hmm. about these things is important. But it's only important if it's to like, to give you that fortitude and that motivation to go out and take action. Because it, if you don't take the action, like you say, you just, you fall back. It's like, where is your reward at? Is your reward in a job well done? Or is your reward in likes and retweets? Right. Where is it at? Where is it at? Because there's, as people, it, like I noticed this, as people start to break off into these little camps, I noticed that some of these, especially internal conflicts, gain their own momentum by like two people or more having a, a conversation. And then it's like, Twitter especially has this very weird dynamic of like, you can, with, with your likes or with your retweets, you can mm -hmm. sort of boo, buoy up which side you want. It's kind of like you can almost cheer for mm -hmm. one, one gladiator or the other. Right. And that keeps them fighting. Right? It's like the kids in the schoolyard like, fight, 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 <laughs> fight. That makes the fight happen. It makes it happen. Whereas like if everybody was just like not interested and just walked away, those two individuals might not even fight. But it's because everybody circles around, right? So that's why for me, I'm just like, you know what? I see that you wanna circle around. Mm -hmm. I see that you wanna circle around and you wanna see me go to blows and duke it out with these people. 
One, I get absolutely nothing from winning that argument. Two, they're not going to let the last word be the last word. <laughs> yeah. They're not, even when they're wrong, they're just going to change the subject. Uh -huh. Yeah. Or go to an ad hominem, right? And start making, throwing insults and whatnot. So they're not going to let it end. And three, I don't have that kind of, ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. I have shit to do. <laughs> I have shit to actually do. Yeah. So, so I mean, it's a, it's a very, it's very interesting. It's going very, the muting is going very well for me. I'll say that. I think, uh, I just thought of something. I think the same thing is also happening with the road situation with the, with the mm -hmm. government stuff. Um, in turn, like the same thing that's happening with crypto in that space, how that you have this, you know, the people that are speculating and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I think it's happening also. And I think kind of getting back to the beginning of the show, like, who will build the roads, you know, and it's going to be, I think you put on the post, it's going to be us. That's right. You know, that's right. Nobody else, nobody else is going to do it. Nobody else is going to do it. And I think, which brings us to, I think that's a perfect segue for us to go to break and come back with Dan Johnson, because he, he is yet another person who's not just about talking about it, but is about actually being about it. You know what I mean? Doing mm -hmm. it. And uh, so we're going to talk with him when we come back from the break. So why don't you go ahead and go to the break, and then we will be back with Dan Johnson. The Spirit of Art The Spirit of Technology The Spirit of Individuality Baby Vodka an ultra-premium spirit conceived by Vin Armani. Handcrafted and distilled in Las Vegas by master distiller George Bratz. Each bottle, a celebration of the individual, custom engraved and hand-signed by the creators. Each element blending in harmony to create a beautiful experience beyond imagination. Baby Vodka, the spirit of Vegas. Created by Vin Armani. Tailored by Christian Rays. Available for purchase exclusively with cryptocurrency at babyvodka.com. Welcome back to the Vin Armani Show. We are streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Vin Armani. Also on Twitter and Periscope at Vin Armani is my handle there. We're proud members of the Activist Post Podcast Network, so you can check out all of our audio archives at activistpost.com. You can also check us out on dozens of terrestrial radio stations, satellite, and also on the internet, because we are members of the Liberty Radio Network, and you can check that out out at lrn.fm. Bunch of great shows, including many of them coming from right here in the Live Free or Die state, New Hampshire. Uh, great shows such as Free Talk Live. So we are very, very glad to be members of the Liberty Radio Network at lrn.fm. So before we get to our guests, I want to talk to you a little bit about counter markets, counter markets, trends and strategies for maximum freedom. You get your first issue for free by going to countermarkets.com. Hard to believe it's already been over a year. So we already have people renewing their subscriptions. I want to say thank you to everybody who has done that. This month is the uh, final or follow-up second episode of my epic battle with the city of Las Vegas uh, in regards to an art gallery and event space that I started uh, a couple of years ago, 
interesting story, a really a uh, sort of an exploration of the failings of local government, the inefficiencies of local government, and, and what you can do as an individual, some advice on what you can do as an individual, particularly as an agorist, to, uh, to protect yourself, but also to win a couple of these battles, because it's important that we, uh, that we start winning some of these battles and showing to the public and proving to people that we actually, as uh, freedom-loving, peaceful, voluntary interacting people can get a lot of things done. And with that, uh, we can start the discussion with our guest on that topic. Our guest today is Dan Johnson. Dan Johnson is the executive director of We Do Better. Prior to joining We Do Better, he was the founder of People Against the NDAA, PANDA, which he grew into one of the largest civil liberties movements in America and served as president of the uh, Solutions Institute, an activist training center. He has written for over a dozen news outlets, including the Huffington Post, frequently speaks at major events around the country, and has appeared on numerous radio and TV shows. Dan Johnson, welcome to The Ben Armani Show. Thank you so much for having me back. It is good. It is good to have you back. When we had you on the last time, you were the executive director of the Tax Revolution Institute. But now uh, it's We Do Better. Can you talk to us a little bit about just that? We'll get into your history, but talk with us a little bit about the, uh, the morphing over. Is there a difference? Is it just a name change? Did something change yourself? Talk to us about how the Tax Revolution Institute came to be, and then why you decided that We Do Better uh, makes a little more sense and, uh, and is now the, the brand. Well, sure, and, and thanks so much for having me back on the show, Ben. I really enjoyed my time uh, last time on the show. Um, uh, I was running the Solutions Institute, uh, the activist training center you were talking about, uh, when I was approached by a group of organizations that had been targeted by the IRS. And uh, they said, well, we want you to take on the, the tax code. Uh, and, you know, I love impossible tasks. So I decided that, you know, we'd take on simplifying the tax code. And uh, uh, we started out with, you know, keeping up, trying to keep the IRS accountable. We ended up kind of forcing the IRS to back off of a rule uh, that would have limited the speech of various nonprofit organizations in the country. And uh, uh, then we started looking really closely at tax reform. And it's like, well, how can you make the tax code simpler? Um, and we found that uh, the reason taxes is it's not the most mind blowing, uh, you know, revelation in the world, but we found the reason why taxes are so complicated is because life is complicated. Mm. And because and the more of life you have in taxes, the more complicated your taxes are going to be. And so we, we honestly started from that very small uh, avenue uh, of let's just simplify the code and make it easier for people uh, to, uh, well, how do we actually do that? And what we found was, uh, uh, well, there are already all these organizations out there that perform similar services to government, do a better job, serve more people on less dollars, and uh, are already, uh, people are already able to support these organizations. So at least a little bit. Uh, and also the, the federal tax code says, hey, the nonprofits, you can take a tax deduction, you know, which is you know, still punishing you for giving the nonprofits, but right. it's a recognition by the government that, hey, um, these guys do at least some of our job. Uh, and that's why you could direct your taxes to them. And so we came from that perspective and we, we read the uh, IRS tax code in front of the IRS building uh, on tax day a couple years ago. And uh, we kind of came to the realization that if we're going to take this on, we need to go at it from a completely different angle. And uh, that angle um, is recognizing that Practically, if we want to get anything changed in this country, and I know anarchists don't particularly think practically or voluntarists don't particularly think practically all the time, but if you want to get something really done in this country, you have to think practically. And practically, we have a ton of people who are on the left and a ton of people who are on the right, and both of them have to back your idea before your idea is able to take root in policy or before your idea is able to take root in people's minds. Mm -hmm. And uh, on taxes... 
it's like uh, I'm not sure. Have you ever tried getting someone from the left and someone from the like a hard a progressive and a, a hard conservative to agree on abortion? Oh yeah, that's that's <laughs> a <laughs> impossible task, right? <laughs> it, it it's just about like trying to get them to agree on taxes. But the reason for this is psychological. Taxes are uh, have inputs and outputs like any other transaction in existence. Um, uh, if you buy Netflix, you uh, are thinking about well, how much am I paying for it? Mm -hmm. And uh, what kind of channels am I getting out of it? What kind of TV series am I getting out of it? Um, any transaction you engage, even you donate to a nonprofit, well, who are they helping? And how are they gonna help with this money? Um, if uh, you pay your taxes though, the right only thinks about the inputs, taxes, how much are we paying? The left tends to only think about the outputs, public services, how much money can we get to go to public services? It's one of the only transactions on earth outside of flat out robbery, which you know one could argue there's not much of a difference, <laughs> but it's the only transaction on earth where you don't think about both. And what we realized is by calling ourselves the Tax Revolution Institute, we were doing it wrong. We were focused on the method of which to achieve you know, freedom and prosperity or which to achieve better public services instead of focusing on the outcomes. And the fact is that the organizations, nonprofits, for-profits, informal groups that are run by the people, that are run by your average American, uh, that are run by people who are actually delivering services to the public, it's those organizations that do a better job for the very people we need to serve. And quite frankly, we, the people, do better than government. And that should be our message, whether libertarians or voluntarists or anarchists, the message is not, oh, here's how terrible government is. The message is we do better. And that's why we changed our name. So I love this. I mean, we recently had two stories that I thought were, were awesome. One is kind of specifically towards yours. The Country Time story was, I thought was just great of Country Time reaching out and uh, bailing all these kids out who were, the, you know, there was this rash of silly, uh, you know, kids getting regulated for lemonade stands. That was cool. But then Domino's filling in the potholes, which I thought was, was super cool. But as cool as those were, Clearly, both are great PR moves. I do think that it, it, it does speak to an idea that perhaps the libertarian ethos is emergent. That these major corporations would think, oh, it's actually a good PR move to do something that's kind of, that a voluntarist would think was a cool move, right? Mm -hmm. But I know that there are many organizations that are doing great work, doing it much better than any tax-funded governmental organization can. So I know that there are going to be people listening to this and they're going to be like, no, it's just not, but what about, there's always going to be, what about X? What about Y? What about, oh, there's some things that only a government could do. I don't, I, as a voluntarist, I definitely don't agree with that. But I think that there's some empirical evidence. I know that you are creating a, 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 a database and a, a resource for people to understand at all these different levels where private organizations are actually doing better. What are some of the standouts for you where, where you really feel like they're doing better and they're just doing demonstrably much better than the government? So, uh, and I'll highlight a few on the show, but all of our standouts are, uh, if you go to wedobetter.org and you look under We Do Better up top, uh, you'll see those who do better will pop down. Uh, click on that because there are about 30 different organizations, uh, certainly I won't be able to highlight them all uh, on this show, that do demonstrably better. They either address a problem that the government is not addressing or they address the same problem a government agency is addressing and they do a better job. And they're just examples. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands out there, but I just want to give a few examples. So, so one of the ones that is amazing to me, I really stand out, is it's called Saved in America. Uh, it is an organization of former law enforcement, uh, Navy SEALs, and uh, private investigators. And they have one job. That is to find missing children. Hmm. Uh, they've found over 70 children since 2014. Wow. It cost the organization only about $5,000 to find each child. 
and uh, they find them in an average of nine days. Wow. Now, if you think about your parent, right? You've just been struck with the worst nightmare of your life, which is that your child has gone missing and they haven't come home in a couple of days. Um, you're, you, you, this is the worst time that you could possibly imagine. And uh, uh, if you sent law enforcement out there to go try to do this, uh, on average, you're looking at a couple of months uh, to find your kid uh, if they're lucky. Um, you're looking at several million dollars uh, worth of expense. Um, and uh, you compare these two organizations and you say, okay, what if we took the million dollars that was in uh, this law enforcement coffer to go find a missing kid and we gave that million dollars to save in America? How many more kids could be found? How many more kids could be returned to their families because this organization is doing a better job? And that's one example just out of San Diego. Another example and an organization that co-testified with us uh, when we had a bill introduced and we had a hearing in California on our bill, uh, like I said la on this last show, that, that we're not an organization that just likes to talk about things. We're an organization that likes to take practical action. And, uh, and or the organization that testified with us was Generate Hope. Generate Hope was started by Susan Muncy. And as she testified uh, with me, she was sex trafficked at 16. Um, she went through the system for not, not a little bit of time uh, and then she started her own nonprofit. And her nonprofit, it's $50,000 to uh, take a woman, uh, help her out of the sex trade, uh, help her recover from the PTSD and the impact that has, uh, help her you know, uh, be a scholar and start to gain academic knowledge and start to go into the workforce. It's $71,000 to jail that exact same person for one year hmm. in the California prison system. Hmm. And so if you, if you go, I can give you example after example, example, but again, they're all on wedobetter.org um, of organizations that uh, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna come out and say, hey, oh, government does everything worse. Uh, I think that there are many areas government is not well equipped to handle. Um, but the, the fact is, whoever does a better job, if government genuinely does a better job, then you know what? Government should be able to do that job. But if the nonprofits and if the um, uh, civil society is doing a better job for people, um, you know, imagine if we could uh, find 700 kids in a month instead of one. I mean, this is the impact that happens when uh, we rely on these organizations instead of looking to the all-knowing, all-powerful government. Um, and I want people to be able, as our name says, we do better. I want people to be able to work together with each other uh, across partisan lines, across racial, across economic lines. I want us to be able to work together to solve our problems, not because it gives me a good feeling, but because genuinely we do a better job. I love this. I love this. So, so we've got, I know one example that, that was clear during the hurricanes, and it seemed like obviously the standout was uh, Cajun Navy. I know those guys mm -hmm. do great work, but also my buddy Jack Spierko was sending people down. It seems it seems like, you know, the the one thing that I that I hear from people who are just like hardcore status, uh, who don't even want to consider these ideas, right? Like, not I think most people who are what you would call like limited government or minarchists are like they're all about this. This is like this. They're like this is a great first step, and I think it's I think it's pretty much the way that we the approach that we have to take. It's kind of like we got to take it in terms of sort of the ends first, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One th one thing, though, and I, I want you to comment on this because it's it's a I think libertarians get a rap for being uh, maybe ne for, for having a, a negative outlook on things. But I don't see that in this because I see that there's so much hope because it really is to say what I hear from status so much is like, no, if it wasn't for the government, no one would do anything for each other. No one would do anything like people don't people don't just want to help other people. That's not that's not how it works. Children would die in the streets like but clearly mm -hmm. disasters happen. Things go wrong. People reach out and try to help their fellow man. As you've gone through and looked at these organizations, what would you say about the vein of sort of hope or positivity? What is it that these people are getting out of this? 
And is this, do you think that this is, uh, that they are the exception? Or do you think that, that perhaps they're actually the rule? Well, I think that one of the reasons why libertarians get a bad rap uh, about caring about people or about their outlook on life is, well, two reasons. Number one, they focus on how bad the government is, uh, which in many cases, a lot of the reason people are libertarians, which, you know, it, okay a lot of the reason people are libertarians is they've had some sort of abuse uh done to them by a police officer a government agency whatever that's fine and and that is your life story and that is reasonable and uh, that is a, a really good reason to seek reform um but focusing just on the bad doesn't provide anybody a solution if you hit somebody over the head with the back of a baseball bat and you and and you go that hurts doesn't it oh doesn't that really hurt and you don't give them an alternate solution mm -hmm. outside of, you know, hitting you with the bat, um, th they're, they're probably not going to care for you very much. Uh, and if you look at how libertarians have presented that, it's, it's generally, uh, and I speak as a political independent, it's, it's generally, you know, focused on the negative outlook. But another piece is libertarians tend to focus on the individual. And while that's not wrong, the way that for centuries humanity has operated is when we needed to solve a social problem or when we needed to come together that, or when we needed to address something, we came together to do it. We came together as people. We got to know our neighbors. We, uh, you know, there's a fire at some guy's farmhouse. Everybody gets the buckets out. Mm -hmm. It's not the individual who's going to come home and fix the pothole in the road after working a nine to five, you know, incredibly strenuous physical job. It's not what he's going to want to do. He's going to want to pay a company or a nonprofit or someone like that to come do it. And I think if, if there was more focus on the, on the collective mentality, <clears throat> that would help a lot. Um, the collectives are not bad. In fact, collectives are the pinnacle of human innovation. Collectives are when humans come together and pool their knowledge and pool their resources and uh, actually get together to solve problems. Um, but if libertarians continue to say, well, the only collective is the government, well, then the only way to solve problems is the government. And hmm. so that might be another thing to look at. But to answer your question, the positivity and the thing that people get out of it is uh, they, they get a good feeling when they help their fellow man. I mean, Shakespeare talked about giving is twice blessed. Yes, some nonprofits you know, are paid and, and some staffers are paid and a lot of them deserve to be and they do amazing work and they're underpaid compared to everybody else. But um, we like to help our fellow man. We like when, when we see a, a guy on the street who uh, it, we, let's say we see a homeless guy on the street and we know he's homeless and it's not his fault and we know he's been working at it. We know he's been trying hard. Who doesn't want to go help? Right. And guaranteed, if you don't want to help, you're going to be pressured by other people to do it. Being a tax evader, government again, is viewed as one of the only ways to solve problems. So even being called a tax evader uh, is a really bad thing. You don't, you don't like, you know, show up at a party and you're like, hey, what? One dude's like, yeah, I'm an astronaut. And, and the other guy's like, hey, I worked in the grocery store. And the other guy's like, yeah, I'm a tax evader. <laughs> but, like nobody like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're awesome, man. Keep it up. There, there's social pressure in addition to good feeling. There's social pressure to take care of those and to give back to as many people as possible as you go throughout your life. And uh, a combination of that good feeling being giving us twice blessed and uh, that social pressure. I mean, you look at, uh, I, I want to throw a statistic out here. Private giving mm -hmm. hit $400 billion in the United States for the very first time last year. Hmm. Now, think about this. They're already got between st late state, uh, local, federal, and fines and fees, anything that goes into government revenue, about 50% of people's income on average goes toward government revenue. So they're already giving half of what they earn to help other people, even if they're being forced to, they are. And then on top of that, they're giving another $400 billion, only some of which is a tax write-off. I mean, if there's anything that shows the generosity of people and the amazing positive spirit of people, uh, then those numbers should do that trick. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the those numbers and about how that how that whole thing. I, I, and I think the the place that I love how you're approaching it because I do think that this is the challenge. The challenge is we want to move forward with the types of organizations that you're talking about. We want to start moving simply because 
they do better. If for nothing else, then it's just a better use of the money by any empirical measure. We want to move as much money as we can, as you said, like with the missing kids, right? Prime example. Mm -hmm. We'd rather, there's limited resources, we'd rather use the, ma the maximum resources, get the maximum bang for the buck. But, but, we don't, it, it, we know that if we put it over into the hands of government first, even if the ultimate goal is to deliver it over to these other organizations, that eventually those organizations will also become a part of the government, which then becomes corrupt in the way that government becomes, and we lose the return on investment that was the whole idea in the first place. Correct. That being said, so you've got your taxes. We don't want the tax money to be attached to it. But then at the same time, as you say, already half of people's income is going. How, how do we create a framework where we can start to bring these other ones in, knowing full well that the, here is this massive tax burden and this, this theft in many cases that's just out and out theft that's happening that's being, and waste? How do we start to bring this in in a way where we can start to take some of this money, this wasted money, and start moving it back down into the area where we actually do better? So it's, it's a good question. I think it's the prime question. Um, because it doesn't matter uh, if miss the uh, you know saved in America uh, can uh, find a missing kid in a little over a week for five thousand dollars. If they only have fifty thousand dollars to do it, they're only going to find so many children. Um, and uh, so the question is, how do we send our resources to those who do the best job? And I want to address the the point about uh, well, if we give it to government, then you know nonprofits turn into government. It's absolutely true. Um, what we found, in fact, is uh, that uh, for nonprofits, if a nonprofit receives a private grant, and this is the uh, kind of the first study or review of this kind that's ever been done, uh, we haven't released it yet, but the, the basic summary is if a nonprofit uh, receives a grant from the government, their administrative expenses, mm -hmm. i.e., they have services and administrative, right? Their administrative expenses go up by a ratio of 2.5%. If they receive money from a private individual, uh, their administrative expenses go down by a little over 4%. Hmm. So, so if you look at the difference in when a nonprofit starts taking money from government, it's not that government is bad. It's that the system of forcing people to fund things that they think aren't effective or that they don't want to fund or that they're not interested in and they're not helping with, that forcing people to do that through the governmental system um, that will affect any nonprofit, any for-profit, any, any group of people that relies on that resources don't go where results are, uh, that's going to change. It's going to happen to them. And there are a lot of nonprofits and people can point them out. You know, people ask, well, what about the Red Cross? Well, what about Wounded Warriors? A lot of these nonprofits get a lot of money from the state and federal government. Um, and so they're going to be burdened by a lot of the same problems. Hmm. But uh, the, the uh, answer, as far as a framework, I like working with ideas that already exist. Um, I, I tend to be a person who likes to win. Uh, <laughs> I don't tend to be like a person that. who likes uh, that's to fine. lose. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I like to work with ideas that, that already work. And, and in Arizona, for the past 20 years, uh, taxpayers have been able to, as I talked about on the last show, direct about 200 of their tax dollars to any uh, nonprofit organization that serves the impoverished. And uh, uh, the last time I was on this show, the numbers we had were from 2015. In 2015, 130,000 taxpayers sent $36 million to these organizations. This, the report came out from 2016. That is now up to 136,000 taxpayers sending $52 million hmm. to these organizations. And at the end of that uh, year, in 2016, they doubled it. We didn't even know what the results looked like then, but we're expecting a little over $100 million uh, directed to these organizations. And the way that credit works is the government never gets its hands on the money. Hmm. Uh, the government says, you're going to have to pay X amount in taxes, and then you're able to say, okay, I'm going to donate, you're able to donate $500 or you know, $100 here, $100 there, $200 there. You're able to donate up to $400 to any organization anytime throughout the year that is, you know, uh, 
uh, supports the impoverished. And then at the end of the year, you tell government, oh, by the way, I didn't give you this money and uh, uh, I gave it to these guys instead. Um, so you take that decision making, you take that centralization out of the hands of the government and you make it a conversation between the nonprofit and the taxpayer as to which organization gets the, the resources and uh, which organization do I want to give to, which organization is making the best impact. Politicians will make decisions, monetary decisions, based on politics. Your average person will make a decision on where their money goes based on the impact. We want more of the latter and less of the former. I like this. I like this. Okay, so, so how do we... How do we move that or step that forward? Is it, is it on a state by state basis? Is this the type of thing that could potentially uh, be done federally? What is the what is the move? Because I know that that's something that you are have been involved in, and 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 working this legislation through is something that clearly is important. How what do you see as the as the pathway towards towards starting down this path? Because I think that it's a very, very good start and a good win. And, you know, these are the types of things that once you get them in, you get it in at that 400 and then you just start expanding it over time. I love it. So yeah. what do, how, do we, how do we do this? How do we move this thing forward? So we've developed a model that we used in uh, California. Uh, in California, SB 1485 was introduced under the We Do Better banner. It would have allowed Californians to direct about 500 of their tax dollars to organizations uh, that do a better job serving human needs uh, than the government. Uh, and of course, it's California. So uh, if I had gotten it passed in California, I'd be on an island drinking a martini instead of, you know, <laughs> not, that, not that I don't like your show, Vin. Um, but uh, it was shot down in committee one to three to three. So three abstention and three no and one yes. But what was key about that is in two weeks, we were able to get 21 organizations in California to back the legislation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to pin the chair of the committee, who all politicians, the way they get their power is they go to people and they say, I will solve your problems for you. And here's the list of problems that I'll solve for you. That is the only way a politician gets their power, at least in the United States. Um, what happens if you take away that justification? What happens if you say these people provide the services and I'd like to send my money to them instead? Mm -hmm. um, all of the sudden they have to choose between power and the veneer of helping people that they use to get elected. Mm. And what happens if they choose the, the power, which is what the politicians in California did is, uh, they lose their justification for existence, more or less. Like they lose their justification to be con control over the money if they don't care about the outcomes for people, right. but instead care about state revenue. And that's what they, they said on committee. They said, this is gonna cost the state $4 billion, which is an absurd uh, amount, but you know, if it costs the state 4 billion and people get helped, I don't, I don't see why that's a problem. Um, but if it, it's gonna cost the state of California $4 billion in the first year, and uh, uh, we can't possibly, you know, absorb some of that hit. So, uh, you know, we'd have to cut out so many people out of this and, and you know, it, it'd be such an issue. And, you know, you guys have to be reasonable and stuff like that. But, but the problem is that people want more say in how problems are solved. People really want a, a unifying cause. They want a unifying movement. The populist wave, Bernie Sanders with Trump is sweeping the nation right now. And it is sweeping local and it is sweeping state. And it is it's going to sweep the national elections. It's already, it's already swept the national elections and it'll do it again. Um, that exists and those politicians are now in the position where we were able to give, I was able to talk to both a revolutionary socialist and a Republican party state uh, com or, uh, central committee in the same day and both of them said this is something we want to get behind hmm. so the model is simple the model is uh, we i just set up three teams in the past two weeks we do better san diego uh, we do better idaho was officially set up this morning and uh, we do better denton county texas last week that property tax or income tax either one you can take on uh, counties usually have property tax, cities sometimes have income tax, and states have income tax uh, in a lot of cases. 
Um, but you take on either of those and uh, you uh, introduce a bill, which is the universal charitable credit that we've designed and we've created for states and counties and we haven't created it for yours, we'll create it. Um, and uh, then you rally nonprofits, you rally uh, political organizations and active people and you talk to legislators and you start building a base around this that the politicians can't ignore. So the simple step is you look at the legislation, you build your coalition, and uh, then you get that legislation passed and you start promoting it and saying, hey, you know, go out and do this. We've developed that model. Um, we already see it starting to work in California. Uh, I probably have another five or six teams to set up in the next week and a half or so. We are mainly speaking to mainstream America. We're not I mean, I, I'm going to be speaking at the Libertarian National Convention, uh, but I'm also going to be speaking at the Blockchain World Conference. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're starting to speak to a lot of mainstream people and say, look, if we want to solve the problems in our nation, the way to solve them is to come together as Americans, as people, and to say, we do a better job and we should have the resources to do it. And if that rallying cry is heard in cities, in counties, in states around the country, then a grassroots movement rises up, removes the justification of the politicians for the power they have, has a, and you have a direct way to now say, I will choose how we solve problems in my community, and I will direct my resources to those who do a better job. Imagine how that starts to bring the country together. Imagine how that starts to heal the divisiveness when we come together as we the people. I could go on and on about the positivity and optimism that I see in this movement, but we're, the, the fact is we're taking off like a rocket. We're starting to uh, win. We're starting to be in high demand from people who say this is the solution we want to see in this nation and we'd like you to come along so for those people who do want to come along and uh, this and by the way i just do want to to say that this does seem to be exactly the type of thing that both left and right can get behind because it's like no, no matter who you are you there's something that government is doing that you know, especially if you're a very politic, like politically minded person and turned on politically, you know that there are private organizations that are doing things way better than government is, whether you're on the right, the left, libertarian, whoever you are. So for those people who want to per perhaps participate in this, those people who want to look in and say, hey, I think that's something I'd like to do in my community. This show today has been all about taking action, so this is perfect. What do they need to do to get in touch with you, to take the next steps, to, to really try to move this thing forward. Absolutely. So they go to wedobetter.org, that's wedobetter.org, uh, and they click on get involved and they shoot us a message and say, hey, I want to get involved, uh, I want to start. And whether you want to, uh, you know, we have several, we're, we're funded completely by monthly donations, small monthly donations around the country. So if you want to say, hey, I want to do that, or you want to say, you know what, uh, I'd like to be a team leader. I could see this as, as a solution for my community. And, and before I, I do that, I, I want to uh, uh, step back for a second and talk about some of the impact that this can make in a community it, instead of it, just the unity side. Um, we'll talk about some of the impacts this can make. Uh, you talk about uh, minority groups, um, people who, especially people who are political minorities. Uh, they're not going to get resources invested in their communities. A good example being inner city youth. Mm. Uh, after the, the Bloods and Crips uh, you know, have been at each other's throats for a while, but after the Watts riots, they decided we're going to have a ceasefire. Um, we're going to help kind of rebuild this community. And they were promised by LA politicians through a program called Restore LA that they were going to restore the community. And so the violence stopped for a couple of months. And then of course the gangs realized that they're not actually gonna uphold these promises. The politicians were stealing the money and uh, the money was never going to go to restore their neighborhoods. And of course, the violence, uh, unfortunately, kicked back up. And uh, uh, it is those minority communities that are never receiving any help because they're not in favor with the politicians. Well, they're finally going to have some resources to direct where those resources need to be with the charitable credit. Um, another good example is holding government accountable. Uh, I know you have a lot of libertarians who listen to this podcast 
Uh, and maybe you have people who've organized protests and who have organized rallies and who have you know, gotten people to call their congressmen. All of those are good, but they're missing the one part of accountability we have everywhere else, which is I can take my money somewhere else if you don't deliver me the best service. Mm -hmm. And certainly abusing your rights is not delivering you the best service. So now you have a direct accountability measure. Imagine what this does to special interests. Imagine what this does, putting power in people's hands to determine government policy instead of just the guy who runs, you know, so-and-so's campaign. Uh, it's, it's not just about, uh, oh, well, we're sending money somewhere else. It's about giving the people a say in what goes on and allowing us, progressive, conservative, libertarian, non-political, allowing us to come together and say, you know what, we the people truly do a better job. And if you believe that, if you're listening to this broadcast, you could give me examples. Um, I, I talked to a guy in Alaska uh, a couple weeks ago, and he said, uh, I was on uh, Intercast recently with, with Jeff Berwick. Yep. And he, he said uh, he was listening to Intercast on the way back. He, he works for the government up there. Um, he was listening to Intercast on the way back. And uh, he was saying uh, he had just finished presenting at a little symposium where nonprofits had talked about the great work they were doing. And he said he had to present the piddling work that the Alaska government had been doing for people in front of all these nonprofits. And, and he's driving back and he listens to me on Intercast and he's like, this is, this is the solution. This is the way that we can help people the most. Hmm. And if you, if you believe that, if you're listening to this and you say, you know what, we do a better job and I'm willing to step up and help, go to wedobetter.org. Click on the Get Involved link. Uh, obviously, if you have any questions about We Do Better, uh, you can contact us through there. Uh, I've been in politics now six and a half years, and, which is, oh my God, I can't believe I've been in that long. But um, <laughs> I've been in the, the, what we broadly call politics six and a half years. I passed legislation. Uh, I've been involved in, in, in lawsuits. I've been involved in protests and rallies and petitioning. All of those ways that we're supposed to redress grievances with the government and find solutions to people or for people. And uh, at the end of the day, if uh, we rely on the government for those solutions, uh, we will never get anywhere near as far as if we support and empower the people to reach out, to help, to work with each other. And that's why I'm doing We Do Better. I love it. I think that's a great, uh, that's a great place to leave it off. WeDoBetter.org. If anybody wants to go and uh, and check it out again, and I hope everybody does because this is really like I love I love those concepts that are that have a huge what I call a duh factor to where you're like you hear it and you're like well duh yeah of course that that tells me that that's but it's also one of those things where it's like is nobody nobody's doing this like this makes total sense so it's wonderful what you're doing. Uh, I, I hope to have you back on again. Hopefully it's not another year before we do it. And you can give us some, <laughs> you give us some updates and we can, uh, we can talk. And I think, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to start working this around New Hampshire. This is New Hampshire is a place where this should definitely be happening. So, uh, Dan Johnson, Wonderful. thank you so much for coming on and we will, uh, see you again soon. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks a lot. Christian. There he is. Hey, hey dude. Yeah, that was that was awesome, dude. So you know, it's it's so <clears throat> it is such a duh factor, isn't it? Yeah, and it's it's such a duh factor, but it does take some somebody to come out there and do it, so you can understand it, you know, so so people can actually see the solution right in front of them and start to move their energy in that direction, you know. Well, and and again, it's like to to actually go and take some action. Yeah. I mean, that's been the that's been the theme of the entire show, right? Is like Yeah. Are are we going to take are we going to take some action? But it's like it's twofold, really, because it's also to say that people there are already people out in the world mm -hmm. who are doing so much with so little. Mhm. Mm because they're passionate about it. They're passionate. Right. Right. And To, to what we should be doing, and I think it goes back to it, it's like, I, I hate the word should. What, what, we, what we will be rewarded, how we will be rewarded, is mm -hmm. to find ways to help people who are already helping people to help even more people, if that makes right. sense. 
Right, and not doing the thing, the wrong things, and look for a reward from that, like going to a protest and and doing all these weird, you know, riots and stuff like that. Like what we're seeing, what we've seen in the last couple of years with political chaos. And I mean, you know, I really think that it, it comes down to doing, taking action. One. If you're doing the wrong things, to understand that you're doing the wrong things and to do something different and not look for a reward when you're doing the wrong things and not to reward those that are doing the wrong things, to reward those that are doing the right things like Dan Johnson. Well, I think I think, though, that's a good point. Right. But how do you know? So so that gets to the point. We don't want to reward people who are doing the wrong things. So what we need Hmm. is we need a new metric of. What is the right thing and what is the wrong thing? That's, that's right. what it is. We need a new metric. And I think yeah. that the metric, is, it's got to be all about results. Yeah, absolutely. Is this person producing a product? Are they producing something? Can you see some like visual? Can you touch something? Can you interact with something that this person is doing that, that is making somebody's life better? If the answer is no, that you don't get rewards. Right. Protest. <laughs> no rewards. No rewards to you. Mm-hmm. No rewards. I give you no, you get no credit. You get no likes. You get no likes. No little hearts. Yep. You get none of that. <laughs> no retweets. <laughs> no retweets. No retweets. Because that's just, that is just tribalism. Yeah. But if you really believe that it can be done better, and you really are supporting those who are doing it better, then I think that we're in a good situation. I think, mm-hmm. I think, I think that's the only way that any of this is going to move forward. So with Great. that, eh, maybe we end a little early. It's super hot right now in my studio. These lights <laughs> are crazy. Today is actually like going to be 90 degrees here in Nashua, New Dude, Hampshire, believe it or I not. Think you get, I think you guys are hotter than Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it it's about to weird. rain. It's about to rain over here, though. So you know, it'll be okay. It's it's weird. It's been like pretty nice weather in Vegas, and then in Reno, my lady's in Reno, and right now, and she's uh she's like, it's cold out here. It's sixty. Oh, it gets cold. Sixty in Reno. degrees. It gets like, cold. I I used to go up to Reno all the time during the summertime. It's high. It's in the mountains. It's nice up there. It's nice yeah. up there. All right, dude. Well, I'll let you get uh, get on with the rest of your day. I'm going to go. I got lots of work to do today. So getting ready for Porkfest. Again, people, you can come Porkfest, porkfest.com, P-O-R-C-F-E-S-T.com, Porcupine Freedom Festival. Anybody who wants to come, if you're on the East Coast, come on up. Uh, so, okay, let me say goodbye to the people. Thank you for tuning in again today. Uh, thank you to Dan Johnson. I think they're doing wonderful work. You can check them out at wedobetter.org. And uh, we will be back. I will have lots of news from Porkfest. I'm looking forward to that. I know people are already up there. So if you guys are checking this out at Porkfest, if you could actually get, get a signal up there, <laughs> then uh, hi to all of you and I'll see you soon. Uh, we'll be back Monday, 10 a.m. next week. Until then, stay free.